Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2022. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure this book, this book is in front of you when you're working with me. Today we'll solve some problems that you will find on page number 119. Please turn to it, page 119. The very first problem that we see there, number 47. In number 47, we are given two equations. First one is 2x plus y, we are told is equal to 7. Then we have x plus 2y, and that is equal to 5. And the question simply is, how much is x plus y over 3. Let's see what we can do. That's what we want to find out. How much is x plus y plus 3? As you can see, if we add the two equations, we'll get 3x and 3y, and that will get us some place. Let's add the two equations. We'll end up with 3x plus 3y is equal to 12. Divide the entire equation by 3, and we'll end up with x plus x plus y is equal to 4. And we're not interested in x plus y. We want to find out how much is x plus y over 3. So divide both sides by 3, and that's it quantity that we're looking for, x plus y over 3, turns out is equal to 4 thirds. Next one, number 48. In number 48, in number 48 we have three towns, populations of, we are given populations of three towns, x, y, and z, x to y to z. We are told that the population of x is 4 times the population of y. The ratio is 4 to 1. We are further told that the population of y is 2 times the population of z. It's 2 times the population of z. The question is, what's the ratio of population of x to y? As you can see, right now we cannot compare the x to y because here y is equal to 1, here is y is equal to 2. We need to convert this 1 into a 2. We can simply do that by multiplying these two quantities by 2. There we go. 8 to 1. The population of x to z is simply 8 to 1. Nothing to it. Number 49. Number 49. Number 49 is another straightforward question. We are given a we are given a graph here. That looks something like this which measures the tidal wave, the length of the tidal wave. This is the high tide, which is 2.5 feet, or rather 2.2 feet, and this is negative 0.5 feet. And the question simply is, what's the difference between the difference between highest and the lowest? The difference between the difference between highest and the lowest is simply 2.2 minus negative point ne negative 0.5 Again, which is what happens, which is what happens when you make too much fuss about it. Difference is 2.7. 2.2 and 2, a negative 2.5, a negative 0.5 is 2.7. The more you make fuss about it, the more likely it is that uh, it's going to get very annoying. Number 50. In number 50, if we're given a series, I need the room for it, so I need to erase this thing. In number 50, we're given a series that looks something like this. We are told S is equal to 1 over 1 squared plus, plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 4 squared plus 1 over 5 squared and so on and so forth until 1 over 10 squared. The question simply is, What's the value of s? What's the value of s? And the choices that we have is s is greater than 3, s is exactly equal to 3, s is between 2 and 3, s is exactly equal to 3, uh, 2, or s is less than 2. Let's see what we can do. Those are the choices. We have to figure out the sum of the series. We don't have to figure out the exact value, obviously, because they're not looking for exact value. You simply have to we simply have to be able to tell them whether it's more than 3, between 2 and 3, exactly 2, or less than 2. 
Let's see what we can do. Think of this. Think of this in terms of money. It will make it easier. If you think of this in terms of money, it will make it easier. Think of this as one quarter, or uh, one quarter of a dollar. One quarter of a dollar is 25 cents. Think of this as 25 cents. A ninth, ninth is approximately the same as, we're going to pretend that it is a tenth. So, so that we don't have to do any calculation. Uh, uh, we're going to pretend that it's approximately 10. That's about 10 cents. 1 over 16. Let's talk about what 1 over 16 is. How much is 1 over 1 16th of a dollar? Let's talk about it, shall we? 1 half. 1 half. Well, we should We don't want to start with 1 half. That's too silly. 1 quarter is exactly 25. 25 cents. If 1 quarter is 25 cents, which means 1 eighth, which is half of it, is going to be about half of that. We're going to pretend it's 24. So it's 12. Approximately. If 1 eighth is 12, 1 16th would have to be about 6 cents. 1 16th is about 6 cents. This is this is about 6 cents. What about 1 over 25? Uh, 1 25th of a dollar is 4 cents. There you go. Let's see what we can do so far. Let's see what we have so far. And let's say think of, think of them in terms of in terms of money. So here we go. We have a 10 here, we have a 10 here, that's 20, 20 plus 25 is 45, so that's 45 so far. And since we're not looking for the exact value, let's pretend that the 6 and the 7 and the 8 and the 9th and the 10th, 10th actually, by the time we get to 10th, it's just one penny. One, 1 over 100 is just one penny. But we're going to pretend that they are all, they are all, same as this value. They are all 4. Obviously, we are grossly overestimating them, because the last value is only one penny, we're pretending it is four pennies. That's okay. And there are five of them, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there are five of them. What we find is that we get 60 cents out of all of this, and we have a dollar over here, it is 1.6. The S is approximately 1.6. It is definitely not equal to two or anything more than two. Whatever it is, it has to be less than two dollars. Less than two. Number 51. Number 51. I'll give you a second here. That's all it is. Don't waste your time trying to figure out the exact thing. In number 51, we are told that we are manufacturing something. And in this plant, in this in this in this factory, between 0.3% and 0.5% of the units are defectives. We are told that uh, they are defective. Every time there is a, there's a defective unit, we have to give a refund of $25 per unit. We promise our customers, we promise our client a full refund in the event that they get the defective unit and the price is $2,500. We have sold total of, we have sold total of 20,000 units we are told. Question simply is how much do we expect to give in refund? What's the range of it? Let's find out. 0.3%, 3%, 3 means 3 out of 100. 0.3% therefore means 3 out of 1,000. So 3 out of every 1,000 we expect to be defective. And the higher, higher end is 5 out of 1,000 because it's 0.5 percent. But we are not making 1,000. This is 3 out of, three out of every 1,000. That's 0.3 percent. 0.3 percent of what? 0.3 percent of 20,000. 0.5 percent of 20,000. This represents the fraction, this represents the percentage in the fraction form. So 1,000 goes away and we end up with 20 times 3 which is 60. Here we end up with 1,000 goes away and we end up with 20 times 5 which is 100. And since we are given a ref since we are giving a refund in terms of in the sum of twenty five hundred dollars, twenty five times six is one fifty, and then we have one two three three zeros. There you go. Somewhere between one hundred and fifty thousand and twenty five times one is just twenty five and four zeros. There we go. One two three, one two three. Somewhere between one hundred and fifty thousand and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars is what we have to be prepared for. To give the refund to the clients after we sell this batch of 20,000 units. Number 52. Number 52. 
in number 52 in number 52 we have, we're going to build a patio we're going to build a patio that's going to look something like this we are told that this side is 15 this side is 40 this side is 35 this side is 20 this is the house and this is the patio the question is was the area of the patio number 52 let's see what we can do the easiest and the simplest way to figure out the area of the patio is to instead of dealing with this awkward shape of the patio let's make it a complete rectangle we're going to figure out the area of this part and simply subtract it from the other part so follow, follow my pointer as I speak this is 35 and this is 15 if this is 15 and this is 35 this side would have to be 20 similarly this is 40 and this is 20 which means this side is also 20 there you go so the area of the patio is simply this side here 40 40 times 35 40 times 35 minus this part that is not part of the patio which is 20 by 20 20 by 20 is just 400 35 times 2 is 70 therefore 35 times 4 must be 140 140 and then this 0 right here 1400 minus 400 it looks like our patio is exactly a thousand square feet 1000 square feet number 53 Number 53 is a very silly question, but we're going to do it because it's there. We are asked to find the square root of 4.2 times 1560 over 15.7. Question is, what's the approximate value of it? They're simply looking for approximate. This is 15.7. And since they're only looking for approximate, obviously they could hardly be looking for the exact value. Uh, since looking for approximate, approximate was, is what, what we shall find. So let's figure it out. It's the same as 4.2. 4.2 is approximately 4. 1560 is approximately 1600. 1600, we're going to write it as 16 times 100. And at the bottom, we have 15.7, that's just 16. There we go. This 16 drops out. The square root of 4 is 2. The square root of 100 is 10. There you go. It's just 20. The approximate value of this quantity is just 20. 54. Number 54. We are told that the sum of five numbers is 3250. The average we are told goes up by 10%. The average of five num five average of these five numbers we are told goes up by 10%. The question is or other. I'm I miswrote it, let me rewrite it, let me start again. We are told that each number each number goes up by 10%. Well if each number in the in this in this uh, set goes up by exactly 10 percent that implies that the average must go up by average must go up uh, must 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 go up by 10 percent as well if you increase each and every number by 10 percent the average obviously is going to go up by one uh, 10 percent if you double every number the average is going to double if you cut the every number in half the average is going to be half so on and so forth we just have to figure out what is 10 percent of that amount because that's that's the sum. We know the sum. Sum, sum of these five numbers is this thing, which is 3250. If we divide that by 5, that's the average. That's, that represents the average of these five numbers. And we just have to figure out 10% of it. 10% is simply 10 over 100. That's 10%. Let's see what we can do, shall we? Here we go. Divide top and bottom by 10. Divide top and bottom by 10. That goes away. That was very simple. 
divide top and bottom by 5, 32 is made up of 6 5, 6 5 is a 30, after we take away 30 from the 32 we have a remainder of 2. What happens to that 2? That 2 goes and joins the 5 and becomes a 25, 25 has 5, 5 5, there you go. It looks like average will go up by 65. Number 55. Number 55. We are getting X dollars per hour for the first 40 hours. For the first 40 hours that we, uh, that we work, we are going to get X dollars per hour. After that, we are going to get $22 per hour for anything 40 plus hour, anything that we work in excess of 40 hours. We are further told that we have made $816 for 48 hours. The question simply is, what is the hourly wage for the first 40 hours for the regular week? Well, let's find out, shall we? We are making X dollars for the first 40 hours, so that's just 40 times X. That's how much we're going to make for 40 hours. Anything above that, we're going to make $22 and we, we are told that we have worked 48 hours, so we have, we have worked 8 more hours. And that amount has to equal the total amount we have paid, $816. There we go. Let's, let's bring this, side to this, this quantity to that side. So 40x would have to equal 816 minus this quantity, 22 times 8, which is same as 102 minus 22. Take out the 8 common. 122, 102 minus 22, 100 minus 20 would have been 80. That's exactly what it is. It is just 8 times 80 equals 40x. Divide both sides by 10, divide both sides by 4. There you go. Simple enough. Looks like looks like our, our, our regular wage. Our regular wage is $16. Number 56. Number 56. Number 56. In number 56 we are given a triangle and we are asked to find the ratio of angle B to angle A. Pay attention, they are looking for the ratio of B to A, not A to B. Pay attention. This is a triangle, this is angle A, this is angle B, this is angle C, we are told this is Y and we are told that this is Y plus 10. What's the ratio of B to A? Angle B to angle, angle A. Well, this is a right angle triangle. We are told this is 90 degrees. It says right there clearly in the picture. It's a right angle triangle. If it is indeed a right angle triangle, that means the sum of the other two angles, the sum of the other two angles must be 90. This angle plus this angle is 90. And this angle is 10 more than this one. That means this must be 50. This must be 50 and this must be 40. Angle B, this is where you have to pay attention. Angle B is 40. So it's just 40 over 50. The ratio is 4 to 5. The ratio is 4 to 5. Nothing to it at all. Number 57. Number 57. In 57 we are being asked to find the value of 8 over 8 plus 8 over 9 over 1 over 2. And we are, we are asked to find the approximate value. Since we are being asked to find the approximate value, which is exactly what we are going to do. So we are going to, we are going to, we are going to claim that this quantity that is given to us is approximately equal to 7 8 plus 1 8 over 1 half. In other words, we are going to pretend that 1 9 is, is, is approximately 1 8. That's, the, that's where the approximation is coming from. We are pretending that 1 9 is approximately 1 8. 1 8 plus 7 8 is just 1. So it's just 1 over 1 half, which is just 2. Which is just 2. Number 58. Number 58. In number 58, we have a two digit number. Let's, let's start number 58 from here. Let's use the whole blackboard for it. In number 58 we are given a two digit number, two digit integer x 
and y. X is a two-digit integer. Like for say, for example, say for example, uh, fifteen. And let's see what y would be. X. We have two-digit integer x and y, and they have their they have their digits reversed. So they have, they have the same digit but in reverse order. So if x is fifteen, y must be fifty-one. Y must be fifty-one. The question is which must be which must be a factor of the sum of the two digits. Okay. Which must be the factor of the sum of two digits. In other words, five plus one or, or one plus five, same thing. Factor of this quantity, x plus y. Well, not five plus one, rather. I mean, fifteen plus fifty-one. Which must be the factor of fifteen plus fifty-one. Let's see what we can do. Here are the answer choices. Six, nine, ten, eleven, and fourteen. Since I wrote this down, let's work on this one. See what happens here. So there are two ways. There are two ways you can go about it. One way is to actually do it out in a classical way, orthodox way, traditional way, algebraic way, the geeky way, the nerdy way. We're going to do that. We're going to do that way if you wish. Here's the quick way first. Just use numbers. Just use numbers. If, if this is x and this is y, we add them up. We're looking for the factor of x plus y. It's just going to give us six and six, sixty-six. Is six a factor of sixty-six? The answer is yes. That stays. Is nine a factor of sixty-six? The answer is no, because six is made up of six and eleven. So the only two numbers that qualify are six and nine. Fourteen does not work. Ten does not work. Nine does not work. There we go. Let's 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 have one more go. Let's say one more go. Make up something else. What should we make up? I'm going to make up 58. I'm going to make up 58. 58 because that's question number 58. 58 and 85. Now, if I were doing it myself in the real exam, I would not have made up. I would not. I would not work with 58 because higher the number, the more time you're wasting. Keep your number small. Keep your keep your number simple. I'm going to give you another example. I wasn't going to give you a third example. I'm going to give you another example. Very quick example. And you will see that not only you will do less work, but you won't have to go two rounds. Here's our simplest one. Here we go. 12 and, 12 and 21. 1, 2, 2, 1. That's it. We end up with 33. 33 is made up of 3 and 10. Uh, 3 and 11, which means, which means 6 goes away right away. 6 is not a fact. 6, it is 33, 6. 6 is not, which must be the factor of 33. 6 is not a factor of 33. 9 is not a factor of 33. 6 goes away, 9 goes away, 10 goes away, 11 goes away, or 14 goes away. Right away you find the right answer in one round. But I'm doing this thing for, to amuse you. Let's do this one since we started it. So it's 13, carry 1, and we end up with 14. Let's see what we can do with it. Uh, this, this is where it takes time, you see. 1 plus 4 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8. Since the sum of the digit is 8, this number is not a multiple of, so this number is not a multiple of 3. Since it's not a multiple of 3, since it's not a multiple of three, that tells me that tells me that it cannot also be multiple of six or nine. It's definitely not a multiple of ten. It is either a multiple of eleven or fourteen. Well, it's not a multiple of fourteen because fourteen will be one forty plus three. If you divide by fourteen, you're going to have a remainder of three. There we go. We got the answer. It's eleven. It is a multiple of eleven. In other words, if you divide one forty three, if you divide one forty three. By 11, 14 has 111, but we take away 11 from the 14, we have a remainder of 3. What happens to that 3? That 3 goes and joins this 3, becomes a 33. And 33 has 3, 3 11. So there you go. In other words, 143 is simply 13 times 11. It's a product of two prime numbers. So this is one way of doing it. But don't fuss about it. Don't make a nice, a big number. Just take a small number like I did here, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, and be done with it. Other way, and you will see now, no matter you will see now, no matter which number that you pick, two-digit number that is, and if you reverse its digits, and if you add up the two numbers, you will always and always and always find that it's a multiple of eleven. Why? In order in order to understand why, we have to look at the algebra. So let's look at the algebra. So we have one number x. Let's say it is t u. T represents a digit. You understand ten digits. So it's not t times u. It's t u like. 73, in which case t would be 7 and u would be 3. And y would simply be u 
T. How do we write TU? 73. How do we write 73? How do we write 73? Well, 73 in the language of algebra is simply 7 times 10 plus 3, which is exactly what this is. This is a 10 digit, so it is 10 times t plus u. And this one, since the reverse of digits are since the digits are reverse, it's 10 times u plus t. When we add them up, we get 10t plus 1t, we get 11t, 10u plus u, we get 11u, and you will find that it's always 11 times the sum of the two digits. This quantity, x plus y, is always 11 times the quantity. Therefore, 11 is a factor of this quantity. 11 is a factor of these two integers, these two two-digit integers. We spend a lot of time on this question, but so be it. Let's get, let's keep going. Number 59. Number 59 is a very silly question. So we have eight numbers, we are told. We have eight numbers, and they begin with negative 5. The first number we are told is negative 5, and we are told that anything that follows, anything that comes after negative 5 is one, one, one more than the previous one. So if the first one is negative 5, the next one is negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, positive 2, and positive 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, oh, that's too many. That's too many. We only have eight numbers. We are told that we have eight numbers. And the question is very silly. Very, very silly. The question simply is, how many of these numbers are positive? Obviously two of them. There are only two positive numbers. They are hoping that you will say three because they are hoping that some people will forget the zero. If you have eight consecutive integers, that's what they are saying. If you have eight consecutive integers, beginning with negative five, how many positive integers will you have? The answer is only two. Number 60. In number 60, we are told that we have a total of S oranges. S oranges. We are going to put R in each box. We are told that N, we already have N full boxes. Each box holds R number of oranges and we have a total of S oranges and we have already filled up N boxes. The question, question is how many more boxes? How many more boxes are we going to fill? Well, you have S oranges and R of them are uh, each box, each box can, can carry R oranges which means S divided by R is the number of boxes we're going to need. For example, if you have 100 oranges and each one holds 10, 10 oranges in each box, we're going to need 10 boxes. This is 10 boxes. We already fixed, we already have, we already filled up n boxes. There you go. We already filled up n boxes, therefore the number of boxes that we need to fill is s divided by r over n. Let's pretend that we already filled up three boxes. If that's the case, this quantity should work out to be 7. Now what I want you to do on your own, what I want you to do on your own, if you don't like the algebra, if you don't want to do it algebraically, what I want you to do on your own is to go through every single answer choice, go through every single answer choice on your own, I'm not going to do it here. Wherever you see S replaces with 100, wherever you see R replaces with 10, wherever you see N replaces with 7, and keep on going until you find that this quantity equals 7. Because that's the answer. If you already filled up three boxes, we obviously have seven more boxes to go because each box holds ten, orange, ten, holds ten oranges and we have a total of 100 oranges. We're going to stop right here. I'll meet you again tomorrow and we're going to pick up from where we left off. In the meantime, if you wish to work with me, if you would like to hire my services to help you get ready for the math portion of the GMAT, send me an email. Go to my website at keshwaniprep.com. Keshwaniprep over there you can send me an email or can fill out the form to, to give me a little bit more information about yourself, whatever you wish. And we'll talk some more. Alright? I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.